everybody, and welcome to Digging the Doom Part 2. First and foremost, I want to say a giant thank you to everybody who listened, streamed, downloaded, shared, liked, even disliked, and showed a friend who did like uh, our first episode, last episode. Yeah, it is the highest traffic, highest downloaded first episode we've ever had on a Blah Blah Network, so that is extremely meaningful to me, especially since this is a weird little solo project about a weird little team. I did not think that would happen. I kind of thought that it would be a an episode that just went out there and uh, went on some deaf ears or maybe found a little bit of a crowd, but for that first episode to already find so many people that enjoyed it, it means a lot to me, and I'm really glad you guys are enjoying it. A lot of the first episode was talking about how how much of the team was there from the very beginning, how much of the soul and spirit of it was there. A lot of this episode is going to be talking about a fan of that first run trying to recapture the magic and sadly not really ever getting to that point. Uh, we are, of course, going to be talking a lot about Paul Kupperberg today. Uh, this episode, not entirely about him, but it is going to revolve a lot around him because this is an era of Doom Patrol that is to some considered a very dark and dire time, the sum is considered a more experimental time and trying to get them into a more cohesive superhero team moment. Uh, and two others, it's just an era they'd want to forget all altogether. But it is a very important time period in Doom Patrol, very, because, for again, for better or worse, it sets a stage for what's to come, and what's to come is very, very good. So let's start off with Paul Kupperberg himself. Paul Kupperberg uh, is a man that has worked tirelessly in comics, uh, written an estimated 1,000 comic book stories, mainly for DC. Uh, he wrote Ambush Bug's first appearance. Uh, Keith Given did create the character, but he was the one that actually penciled the first story. Again, wrote tons and tons of Superman. Not only did he write tons of Superman, he wrote the comic book industry's first miniseries in World of Krypton. <clears throat> Not a guy who hasn't done anything. Uh, also did little things, like, of course, became an editor at DC eventually, did some magazine work. In 2006, left DC to become the editor of Weekly Weird News. In 2008, he became a senior editor of WWE Kids. Uh, this is a guy that was a huge fan of the original Doom Patrol, had a ton of enthusiasm for it, and really, really wanted to do it. Uh, with Showcase 94, he was given that chance. Paul Kupperberg and Joe Staten were given their opportunity to bring back the Doom Patrol in a way. <laughs> DC initially planned the Showcase series kind of an anthology, to launch new characters into their own series, hopefully. Uh, Paul Levitz, the editor, really wanted Kupperberg and Satan to write a Doom Patrol story. Uh, Kupperberg made a new lineup because he wanted to kind of respect the original ending of what Drake did with Doom Patrol, respect that the ending of the entire D team dying at the end of the series. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and at the time, Kupperberg, one of his, what I would say is probably a... Vital mistake in what would come. Kupperberg was highly inspired in this time by the Lynn Wayne uh, Cochran's all new, all different X Men. Something that we've talked about before. As much as New Patrol and X Men get compared throughout their different eras, throughout their different times, it's one thing that remains true is as similar as they are, they are also very different and kind of have to be treated very different. It never quite works out when they're not. Uh, for better or worse, it's just been the case. We haven't talked much about uh, Joe Staten, who, of course, would join Kupperberg on this initial run. He was a co-creator of a ton of stuff. He co-created the first hunt or the Bronze Age Huntress, Helena Wayne. Also, the third Huntress, uh, Helena Bertinelli, uh, Kilowog, and Omega Man. Mostly known for a lot of his Guy Gardner stuff in DC. He did some Dick Tracy things. Uh, Roy Thomas had originally hired Joe for Marvel. But then uh, Paul Levitz recruited him over to work on JSA, and of course ended up going to Doom Patrol. Uh, we mentioned that he was highly influenced by the X-Men at the time. Uh, so he also has uh, talked openly about the fact that uh, he's not super happy with uh, the reboot. He believes he kind of disappointed the of Doom Patrol. He believes that uh, his new guys are more comic book heroes while uh, the originals were these outsiders and freaks and had a very unique place, and he didn't really know how to capture that. <clears throat> so when he brought them back in these showcase issues, these minis, you had Robot Man was back, kind of the only 
sole survivor, kind of, except for his body was replaced by a completely new futuristic body built by Dr. Will, Dr. Will Magnus, a character that debuted in Showcase 37 in 1962. Of course, mostly known for connections to Metal Men. He had uh, Negative Spirit, who now was possessed by, or now possessing cosmonaut Valentina Vostok, uh, a character who eventually would go on to join the Black Lanterns, uh, appear in Season 2 of Doom Patrol, and was featured in the CW Arrowverse. In this new version, Valentina, uh, a negative woman, transferred her powers in her suit instead of kind of shooting it out, so she was still able to have a physical form almost. You had Tempest, a.k.a. Joshua Clay, a Vietnam vet slash deserter, fired the energy blast from his hands, also eventually would become a Black Lantern. As you can see, again, the the new team didn't receive their own series. They were just in the three showcases, and they were, again, much more traditional superhero type of vibe. Uh, after the three showcases kind of failed to really garner the attention that they thought it would, uh, they, the member of the teams would go on to be in different books of the time. You had, of course, uh, a lot of them appearing in Superman crossovers, uh, going back to Kaberg and Satan's connection to the Superman books. They, of course, would have connections enough to make some very interesting tie-ins happen in the Superman books. And Supergirl, uh, Vostok had a lot of stuff going on with there. Robot Man eventually became a reoccurring character for a little bit in Marv Wolfman and yeah, sorry, Marv Wolfman and Perez's Teen Titans. You had Changeling and Beast Boy uh, would arrange for Dayton Industries to recreate the Niles Calder body for Robot Man. Uh, Titans and Robot Man would battle many DP villains in that time frame. A lot of those Doom Patrol villains that kind of they were trying to transfer into current DC continuity at the time, seeing if it would work. Uh, of course, with anything Doom Patrol, as we've seen time and time again, they are in such a unique place in the DC universe that stuff like that never tends to work out as easy as they think it does. Some of the best crossovers with Doom Patrol and mainline DC comics is almost always the simplest or the weirdest. They just, for whatever reason, have never seemed to truly work just put into the DC universe. But, luckily for Copperberg, a little thing would happen called Crisis. And post-Crisis, DC was very open to a lot of new ideas, a lot of things coming back, a lot of things changing. Uh, even though Copperberg was super disappointed with his first small run, he still had a ton of love for Doom Patrol and wrote a new pitch for DC. They greenlit it, and the groundwork began in the John Byrne Illustrated Secret Origins Annual, annual Number 1. Uh, it came out... In 1987, and of course later in that year, in October of 87, they relaunched Doom Patrol, written by Coverberg and drawn by Steve Lytle. Now these, only, <laughs> Lytle only stood around for the first five issues, leftover creative differences. Uh, he didn't really like Paul Coverberg's showcase Doom Patrol era. Uh, he was promised a ton of creative involvement and creative decision making in the series uh, that he did not receive. And after five issues, was replaced by a young and up-and-comer, Eric Larson, who, uh, if you're new to comics or new to comics outside of Doom Patrol, Eric Larson is the uh, creator of Savage Dragon, was a extremely popular artist in the late 80s, early 90s, uh, popular enough that he is one of the founders of Image Comics, currently at CFO. Uh, Eric Larson entirely would have an entire episode by himself. A uh, man that's a legend in the comic book industry, a huge name, and some and someone that is always surprised to look back at and know that they had time with Doom Patrol. Uh, Kupferberg would later say that he uh, he liked Eric Larson's art, but didn't believe he was ever a great fit for Doom Patrol. And uh, Eric Larson didn't really love the plots that Kupferberg was creating for this Doom Patrol run, <laughs> but he openly has stated that uh, if he didn't like the plot, he would re revise it in a uh, drawing something that he now says is overstepping and believes that uh he probably should have been reprimanded a bit more and a bit harsher for it but at the time you know young dumb and just uh getting to work on comics and doing whatever he wanted so he was making it work he said that editorial never had a problem with him doing it but that he uh now kind of regrets some of it now this team was still sadly more of a kind of traditional superhero team you'd have 
New members like Lodestone, Rhea Jones, Carmo, Wayne Hawking, Scorch, Scott Fisher. Uh, Cell started okay, but eventually descended and descended to the point where he was removed. And, of course, eventually replaced by Grant Morrison. And that that will be a that will be an episode, probably next episode, all about the Grant Morrison era, uh, if that's not two episodes. This era of Doom Patrol is a small one and a very, very weird one, stretching two different time periods and two very different mindsets of DC. Uh, it's also it's so interesting to me to see a fan of Doom Patrol, and this happens a lot in comics. We've seen it happen time and time again where you have someone who's a diehard, dedicated fan to a character, to a team, to a moment, and when they get their opportunity to tackle that, they just either don't know how or go too far direction one way or the other. Uh, in Paul's case, I think it's a lot of almost having too much reverence for the original material and being too afraid to completely shock the system and go somewhere new. I think sometimes when you love something so much and you're trying to honor it that much, it can actually in a weird way, backhand you and turn it from a it's this great opportunity into a horrible, horrible burden. I know a couple of guys talked about that. He has some regrets, some loves, some hates of this time frame. And again, it's just a, a very, very weird one, but a very crucial moment in building up the Doom Patrol. This was a time period where it was really shown that, okay, Doom Patrol is hard to make work right. It's not this easy form where you can just plug and play, plug in a different superhero person, and it goes. And it never has been. And I think this is the era where a lot of people really found this out. And of course, when Grant Morrison takes over, would take it and kind of unlock the full potential of the Doom Patrol. Uh, yeah, it's another case where the creators involved in the series are almost, if not more, interesting than the series. They have such interesting lives and interesting careers outside of Doom Patrol and in Doom Patrol that it's one reason why we're focusing so hard on creators on this series right now is, to be honest, this period of comics, like, if you're a hardcore Doom Patrol fan, read it. They're not they're not the worst thing in the world, but they're also not the greatest, and they don't feel like Doom Patrol. There's a lot of issues here, whether it be the showcase issue, uh, mint three issue shorts, whether it be his actual run, neither have a ton of moments that are worth recommending, a ton of moments that go into it. I would say if you're doing a big reread, it is important because it does set up the stage for, again, Grant Morrison, which, not to make this episode about them yet, but obviously if you're a Doom Patrol fan, you're probably a pretty big Grant Morrison fan too. It's uh, very rare to see fans these days of Doom Patrol that are not a Grant Morrison fan and what they brought to the comic and what they brought to the characters. And I know it's, of course, continuing on through the Gerard Way run, continuing on through the Pollock run, continuing on now with uh, some of the stuff that Culver's doing. And so it's interesting to talk about a dark period in Doom Patrol, a period where the books weren't so great, and uh, they didn't really know what they were doing. They kept on trying things, and you had team members leaving, team members coming back, all this other stuff, just trying to make it work. I, I admire the hell out of Cupperberg for trying to make it work so much. I mean... He was a giant fan, loved the series. Similar to if I was handed the series or anyone listening to this hand series, of course you would take it. Of course you would try your best, and of course you would do something with it. It may or may not work, but just having an opportunity to try to make it work is incredible. So I had no hate towards Kupperberg on this show. No hate whatsoever. No hate towards anyone who worked on these books. Look, we all have moments of thinking a project's going to turn out great and it just doesn't come together. And I think that's what Cupperick faced time and time again was struggling. It clearly had a ton of heart and a ton of love for Doom Patrol. I mean, the dude tried over and over on multiple occasions to get it to work and just never quite could. And has been very open about its failures, about where he went wrong, about where others went wrong, and taking, honestly, taking some credit for things that went wrong that maybe weren't even his part. I think if you look uh, at the history of it, it's not only do you have Cupboard one, you have the editorial that are not kind of doing their job at this moment. No offense to Paul Levitz and the people involved, but they were given chances and they were given books, but you could tell, again, they didn't fully understand the characters they were trying to tackle. And it's something that is so hard and so weird with these characters, especially at this moment, because you have to remember from our time frame, we have all the decades and decades of great comics. We have the, the great show. We have all these great crossovers, all the stuff. We've seen them 
from what Jeff Johns does in the main DC continuity with them from time to time to, again, things like Milk Wars, things like uh, Arcudi's run. You have all these different moments that we have seen and experienced and know it works and doesn't work. This time, this was the second incarnation of them. And this was them trying something different that just didn't work. And they tried it again, <laughs> and it didn't work. But if it wasn't for those efforts and failures in trying to make a round peg fit into a triangle hole, we wouldn't have gotten what would end up becoming the foundation to most for Doom Patrol. And I think that's important to recognize how failures, how downfalls, how you know this utter destruction can force you to get up and crawl from the wreckage into something better. And that's where we're going to go next episode. Thank you guys so much for listening to this one. Please like, share, follow, all that stuff. Uh, I am on every social media, I'm guessing, for the most part. Uh, I'm the real Jason Way on pretty much everything. Didn't know, wrestler on top of doing podcasting. That's where there's a name difference. Uh, for this, you can call me Colby. I'm not doing wrestling stuff here outside of, I guess, in the weird way Doom Patrol connects to everything, there are some minor <laughs> WWE Magazine and WWE Kids Comics connections here. Uh, again, thank you for listening. We all at the network, even the people that are not involved in the show, are very thankful to you guys for listening, as I am uh, unbelievably grateful. It means the world to me to share my love of Doom Patrol with the other little weirdos and freaks out there. So thank you so much, and we'll see you next time for Grant Morrison era.